go. All right. Yeah, it's good stuff. I'm, uh, I'm excited. Yes. Now it should be good. I love these sorts of podcasts, mate. They're just like, see, um, see where they roll, see where it takes us and see how, uh, see how deep we go. Hey. Yeah. Sounds good to me. <laughs> so mate, what, um, what actually got you into mental health? Cause we, we connected through, uh, various similar, uh, handles on Instagram and we started chatting from that way, but what got you into mental health? Uh, a series of things, honestly, man, I actually, I started out, um, when I was in my twenties, I worked with teenagers for about eight years. Um, and just really saw a pretty significant need for, um, just to bridge a gap with, uh, kids kind of, especially young boys getting the things that they need in terms of growing up and how to be successful. Yeah. So I started there and then, um, I mean, add in, uh, divorce and going through some stuff on a personal and personal aspect of things and uh, realizing that, you know, I'm not the only guy who is dealing with the kind of stuff I was dealing with, you know, um, and just kind of recognizing a need for guys to have a space to go to, to open up and talk about the things they're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose the, the irony of it is that, you know, we live in a world that's more connected than ever. And yet we also feel more alone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was actually in a meeting today talking about that exact thing. And it's, it's really interesting because we have such an ability to create a community online um, to really help each other out and make something positive. And um, it's, it's like, instead, we just kind of get wrapped up in looking at memes and looking at these inspirational quotes and such that don't necessarily get us anywhere as, as individuals or as communities. And so it's cool to connect with you and actually have this interaction, you know? Yeah. Well, man, that's the thing. Like zoom is, um, zoom and Skype. It's, it's the next best thing, I suppose, but it's still reacting and responding in real time and that sort of shit. So it, um, it does work well. Yeah. And guys, if you, um, if you are interested to have a look at Zach's stuff, definitely check out the handle and it's into the dark blue. So it's into the underscore dark blue, isn't it? Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. What was the, um, what was the reasoning behind that name? I'm interested. <laughs> so, um, yeah, me and my buddy, actually, I'm going to crack open a, a, a beer while we have this conversation, Please. if you don't mind. Please. Um, so, um, but yeah, so me and my buddy who actually originally came up with it, um, we, we've been friends for a long time and, um, I was actually, so the teenagers, the group of teenagers I was working with, we would go on retreats um, out to the, uh, basically out to the woods, out to these cabins in the woods to retreat center. And, um, we would basically have like weekends where we would go out and do like, um, team building stuff and, uh, things that would like basically help people learn to be better uh, in whatever ways they need to be. And so, um, it's kind of vague, I know, but I, I try not to talk about it much because it was actually a church youth group. And so it was a oh, religious big thing. Uh, so, um, yeah, like church retreats, youth group retreats, that kind of thing. And so, um, anyway, we had a rule that was boys are pink. I'm uh, sorry. Boys are blue. Girls are pink. No yeah. purple. Right. <laughs> um, well. so, what's that? Works well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they, anyway, one night the guys were messing around and just messing with me and they came up with well, what about dark blue? Is that okay? You know, we were in the boys cabin and they were like joking around, you know, like boys do. And, um, so that became kind of a running thing, you know, joking about dark blue. Yes. And so as we grew up, that kind of became our just running joke as friends. And, uh, cause they were pretty close to me in age and we ended up just being, becoming really great friends. And so now it's kind of our dark blue crew, our guys that hang out and we get together and we tell each other everything, you know, man, that's so good. It's so powerful and, uh, very much needed. You know, there's a massive, um, opioid crisis in America. There's a huge crisis with methamphetamine in Australia. Um, there are all these things. Which, too, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously these things are, you know, multifaceted and it's not only, isolate social isolation it's also like loss of a sense of meaning addiction issues all this sort of stuff but you do have to wonder how important a sense of community is and you said before like you don't like to um 
speak much on it because it's got like a, a Christian, you know, underpinning and all that sort of stuff. But I've been, I've been studying um, religious value systems for years now. And I reckon that's the stuff that we've lost. It doesn't necessarily have to be religious, but it does. You, we do need some structure in our lives. We do need like a, a system of, of motivation, like a way to act that's, that's moral and a lot of that was given to us by, I was raised a Catholic as well, so it was given us by the church. Um, but now that we don't have that, we've lost that institution that gives us a value hierarchy. It's proving very difficult to instill that within ourselves, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, man. And I mean, especially, you know, in the US, we've got free market economy and capitalism, and that's kind of become a religion, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, between that and our, our politics, um, the, those things have kind of replaced religion to a degree. So we're, we're at this place in the US where it's, it's kind of like a half and half, where, you know, Christianity used to be the majority of our, of our society, like in the 1950s, you know, over the last 70 ish years, we've had a big shift where, you know, going more in the direction of the UK and I, I assume uh, Australia, yep. uh, where religion's not as as uh, important to people as it was. Mm. So you're right, we're lacking that that sense of community that helps teach us what's, what's wrong and right and um, that sort of thing. And we now rely on Instagram, like we were talking about, and that's sort of yeah. thing to figure out where we're going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just, we, um, we yes. run for the pleasure of very good. I love it. What what kind of beer are you can make? Oh, uh, this is an IPA from Bastard. It's called Bastard Cat from Colshan Brewing. Oh, very good. Yeah. 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 Very good. You know, craft beer is pretty big in the US. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now we like our beer here as well. It's very good. We got a the more marketing around beer we can do, the better, mate. Speaking of instant pleasures, if we can develop a value oh. system around beer, I think we're sorted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so yeah. and that's actually what we're trying to do um with into the dark blue and i can tell you more about that later but yeah oh no i'm definitely keen to go into it i just wanted to backtrack i wanted to go to your story a little bit as well because you know you're a human being like all of us and we move through ups and downs and i was interested to uh learn more about what proved to be most important for you in terms of um coming out of the dark blue as opposed uh, as opposed you could say uh man i don't know you know i i've always been really big on like self-discovery and understanding um you know i grew up in the church and that was really a big part of my life but um you know as i got older into my 20s and like started learning a bit more outside of that experience um I started recognizing that the the church that I was taught about, the God that I was taught about growing up, uh, wasn't necessarily um, the the tr what what God truly is, you know, mm -hmm. or what is intended to be. Or, and I, I don't. I started to learn that Christianity now, modern Christianity, um, and, and you know, probably historically, is not what God intended it to be. Um, mm -hmm. If you know that's tradition if god traditionally exists the way that we are taught in the church sure. um, and so anyway i just started to realize that there uh, that god could be outside of the church in so many ways um and so i separated myself from that a bit and started to learn more about me and uh, my my own journey and how to how to be a better person how to um desire to do that outside of the promise of heaven you know mm -hmm. um and so anyway i started learning about buddhism uh which i really latched on to and um it taught me a lot about the value of detachment that's um, ironic you latched on to a non-attachment idea <laughs> right <laughs> very well played yeah. you got it <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> But, but yeah, so, I mean, there's the whole concept of attachment and how uh, we, we tend to put so much stock in the things that we feel give us value, like affirmation from people and status of having things and that's that type of thing. So um, anyway, I learned a lot about learning about being able to detach yeah. from people, places, things, and being okay to exist in the moment yep. and how am I being a positive influence right here, right now? Mm. 
That's brilliant. And what was that process like? And I'm, I really want to get to the, the bottom of it, you know, because I've been writing a book for the past couple of years about identity and moving through, you know, an identity literally changing because it's just so deep. And, you know, for, for everyone listening or watching as well, it's, it's funny when we, we tell these stories, you know, then I found Buddhism and then I was like, as we, we tell them as though, and we conceive it. So like a three second thing, but I'm sure this was months and years, you know, of self discovery and ups and downs. So take us through kind of what that process was like. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a, kind of a big story, but I'll give you, give you the short version. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, like I said, I was, uh, a youth minister for eight years and during that time I was actually dating uh, the woman that I ended up marrying when I was 26 years old and uh, I was a Christian she was atheist and so it made for an interesting combination yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so, do you like stuff <laughs> what's that she's like so do you like stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly that, did you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think the connections we had were like music and I don't know, <laughs> you know, uh, art, you know, we had that in common. No, yeah. there was a lot more there, a lot, a lot more, you know, deeper things that we connected on, but she really did help me learn a lot about perspective and like vantage point and how people see things on a, from the outside, mm. you know? Uh, and so while our relationship was a bit tumultuous, um, in, in certain ways, I learned so much from her, um, in, how to be in terms of faith because it i she helped me recognize how people outside of religious faith see the ugly side of it right whereas when you're inside the religious faith you don't see it yet yeah. you know you're blind to it almost and so uh yeah so i started to see a little bit of the ugliness in christianity and in the church and really wanted to be a part of making things different and creating space for people um, to have that without having to go to church and all the judgment and such. So anyway, um, so that's a part of it. But we, me and my, my ex-wife, we actually uh, ended up getting a divorce when I was 30. Um, and that was a huge turning point for me because at that point I had stopped going to church and um, my relationship, our, our relationship was uh, pretty codependent. And so that's all I knew for about 10 years was the church and her. And wow. so I actually moved up to Seattle where I'm at now from Texas where we were living and that was the first time in my life that I had nothing but myself. Mm. You know, I couldn't, I didn't have people to rely on. I didn't have a church to rely on. I didn't have, you know, the relationship. And so that was the first time that was all about me figuring out myself and um, with no distractions, no interruptions. Wow. <laughs> and I think that was one of the biggest turning points in my personal journey. Um, was having finally that uh, freedom and that space to figure myself out to a much greater degree than I ever had. Yeah. And it's, it's the archetypal hero's journey. You know, it's the, um, the movement to finally giving yourself the space and freedom to figure yourself out. And that's simultaneously the best and scariest thing you've probably ever done. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you know, from that point I started, uh, I made a promise to myself that I would um, travel somewhere different every month. Um, I met somebody on an airplane who was doing this one year challenge where they would travel somewhere new every month. And it sounded awesome. So I was like, all right, I'm going to give that a try. And so I went somewhere, somewhere different, even if it was in like local to a different ski resort or a different hiking trail or something like that. Yeah. that I'd never been to before. I did that at least once a month. That's mad. And I built up to a, my first international trip and I did it solo going to Scotland for the, uh, the Edinburgh French Fest. Amazing. Amazing. And yeah, that made a huge difference. Um, that's, I mean, it was just getting some new perspective outside of my bubble 
yeah. and seeing meeting some new people. Uh, the Fringe Festival, people from all over the world go there. So I made so many friends from different countries and um, so many I still talk to today. And that experience just really helped kind of broaden my, my view on things and uh, kind of set me on a diff- uh, different path. Yeah, it's, it's I, I love this kind of story, man. Like the, the story of self-discovery is just so similar, you know, because we are all, we all have this perception, you know, we're in this, this common world and then something happens that changes our, our ability to perceive that world, you know, and then we're thrust into this new world that's very scary and unknown. And then we realize that the only way to make sense of that world is to navigate it ourselves. So like you have said, you know, got moving up to Seattle and then you have traveling to Scotland. My partner's actually from Inverness. So a couple of, a couple of hours. Oh, cool. after that. So yeah, yeah. Awesome. yeah. So we've been up there a couple of times. We're staying with our family and that was good, but yeah, no. And then moving out there and trying to map this new territory. And then ultimately you come back to the, and obviously you're not back in Texas, you're in Seattle, but you, you become back to this place. And so you feel as though you're equipped to give back because you've moved through the journey that, people you're connecting with are just starting to enter and i think that is that is the ideal when it comes to humanity is like we learn about the world we live in we learn how to navigate it we learn how to connect we learn how to make it better and then we give those tools and we pass them down to to the youth so that at least they'll be able to stand on the shoulders of giants you know absolutely it's good i love it so you've been yeah. doing this podcast for a while. I don't know if you mind me asking you a question, please, please, <laughs> um, please. but you've been doing this for a while. Um, what's your, do you have like a long-term goal, something that you're wanting to accomplish? Um, yeah. Through that? My, my goal is uh, to write a New York times bestseller. Um, Cause I'm a writer fundamentally and it's to Wonderful. you. It's to interview Jordan Peterson, Russell Brand and Aubrey Marcus. I want them on my podcast and I really just, I'd love to Perfect. have, yeah, go for it. Oh no, I was, I was, I'm actually about to write Russell Brand a letter and see if he'll be, if he'll have some kind of involvement in what I'm doing. So well, uh, if that happens, <laughs> that is sick. I'll get you involved. <laughs> yeah, bro. That would be awesome. Yeah. No, look, I think, you know, lots of people have um, a really cool destination, like a big end goal and, I, I love to write every day, but I, I'd love to, obviously, to, you know, it would be nice to get um, um, some kind of like awareness around that. And it would be cool to just um, travel the world and speak about the ideas that I've um, um, been studying with um, with my writing, but just joining in on the conversation, building a podcast to um, attract people like, like those and um, just continue learning, mate, because it's just an incredible technology, you know, like you and I sent a yeah. couple of text messages and now we're, having a mad chat so. <laughs> across the world. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's insane. Cool. Yeah. And I think it's, it's predicated upon psychological ideas. Like I'm, I've always been interested in the mind. Um, you know, I've always been interested in philosophy and what does it all mean and all that sort of stuff. And I think yeah, the more you, here. yeah, yeah. Like you, you take that approach and you, you observe life, from an increasingly further away kind of perception, you, it just helps because it makes you just see the world as it clearly is, which is just a whole bunch of people that are exactly the same trying to figure it out and do their best, you know? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's the thing. I, I think one of the most important things, and it's simple, but one of the most important things that I've learned in the last probably year at my, at my career that I was working in um, is that nobody wants to suck at their job. Yeah. And it, it's like, nobody goes to work being like, I'm going to do a horrible job today. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that kind of goes with life in general. Like nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to do poorly. Nobody, you know, everybody's looking for validation and success. Um, and so it's like, how are we providing those tools and helping people get to that place, you know? Yeah. And so that's, that's what is really important to me is helping to provide those tools. And so I love meeting people like you and um, this community of, of guys that are trying to help other guys get better yeah. <laughs> at, at life, you know, uh, it's so positive and uh, it's very exciting. 
it is it is very positive and it's very fulfilling too and i, I completely agree with you mate it's funny the, the the whole thing around finding a sense of meaning in life is in giving back to others and you would assume that i mean even the way the questions pose like how do i find meaning you know it's right. like it's got like this selfish undertone to it but it's funny that when we start like even on a, a podcast you know providing a platform for someone else to talk about their experience it fills you up you know with meaning and fulfillment too so it yeah. comes back down to all of those spiritual teachings really that just talk about how if you, you want to find a sense of meaning it's it's in about providing service to other people i'm interested did you when you moved away from the church have you since uh gone back to it but with a different lens or are you like how do you classify your spirit spirituality now uh that's a really interesting question um yeah. i uh it, it's i have a, a lot of respect for organized religion and the community that it creates um a sense of belonging that it create creates and i i really i, I still love that aspect of it I don't personally consider myself religious anymore. I don't, uh, I, I find a big difference between religion and spirituality. Yeah. Um, I feel like religion is the man-made side of it and spirituality is the God-made side of it. Um, and so uh, I try hard to stay connected to my spiritual side um, by creating community and staying connected with people and then also staying connected with myself and making sure that I'm doing what I can to stay grounded, which obviously I don't always do the best job at, you know, but that's kind of what helps me bring me back to helps bring me back to center. You know, it's like when I fuck things up, I can be like, all right, don't go that direction again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's where it causes problems. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. No, you're right. And it's hard to, I agree with that completely, man, that the God side institutional spirituality is prone to tyranny because it's obviously humane, you know, and it's, it, you can't yep. bind and shackle the infinite. Um, but it's also very hard to conceptualize the infinite without trying to put labels and, you know, set up the walls and perimeters and things. So yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, how do you differentiate and how do you find spirituality within yourself? And do you have like practices and things that you help you cultivate all that? Oh man, you know, a lot of it I've fallen out of, I've fallen out of practice of, um, you know, I do, I really enjoy meditation and yoga and things like that. Um, because I really do, I think it helps to clear the mind and kind of, um, just give you an opportunity to, to breathe and figure out where you actually are in your life. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very busy here. It's very constantly like, go, go, go. It's like, there's always this perception that you're not doing enough you yeah. know um and i don't know how it is there in australia but um the u.s is very it's like seattle it's very constant yeah so um i try really hard to separate myself from that as often as i can and go hiking out in the mountains because we've got a lot of opportunity here to get outdoors and um do something that's not in the city and so uh it's actually tomorrow i'm going snowboarding with a couple friends so it'll be really opportunity to kind of sit on the sit on the mountainside and just breathe for a little bit so yes absolutely very important <laughs> let's hope you do breathe otherwise this will be the last podcast you ever do mate <laughs> <laughs> right you're done yeah <laughs> love it so um, yeah let's talk about into the dark blue so we know how we know the story behind the name um where do you see yourself going with it like what what's it all about um yeah well, man, I, you know, I've got some pretty big, pretty big visions for it. Uh, so for 2020, uh, I'm actually going out on a national, a U.S. tour, um, a brewery tour. I don't and you can actually find, uh, if you go to our website, at intothedarkblue.com, um, in, on the Real Guys Real Talk blog, there's a, kind of a, a little article I wrote about uh, what I'm doing. But uh, I'm actually taking Into the Dark Blue on the road. And we're going to go to different 20 different breweries around the country, raising money for mental health and uh, helping to or starting to create a network of breweries for uh, guys to be able to go to support groups and uh, like peer support groups and talk to each other about their problems. Yeah, it's perfect. It's so good, especially with beer as the, the <laughs> right. It's a great foundation. Yeah. Um, you know, it really helps to, uh, 
to get people. I mean, if nothing else, it's like, it feels better to have something in your hand, you know, yeah. like instead of trying to figure out like where, you know, pockets or do I, you know, what you like, you have something to hold. Yeah. Um, yeah. And somehow that makes people more secure, mm. you know, um, <laughs> but Beer is definitely a great community, a community builder. And um, one of the breweries that I'm working with up in Seattle is called Obet's Brewing. And it's actually, uh, the, their name is Czech for community. And so I really love what they're trying to do to create essentially a second home for people to go to and um, not just have a good beer, but actually have some good, build some good relationships with people too. And yeah. so, yeah, kind of goes along with what I'm doing. So brilliant. A good beer and a good conversation. Hey, yeah, always. It works really well. And I think you're totally right. Like you know, I was thinking about that when you said it, holding something just takes the edge off a little bit. And I think if you can hold something and this is like looking at it very deeply, so I apologize, but if you, if you're in a, group setting and 10 of you, there are like 10 strangers, but you're all holding the same thing. At least the implicit idea is that you're all together based on the love of the thing you're holding. So there's already <laughs> that like connection. Yep. It's like a book club, except beer. Beer club. <laughs> so well. Drink 10 beers a month. <laughs> but when did it start? Uh, oh, so we've been, so Josh and I started into the dark blue, uh, April last year. So it's been almost a year, but our first podcast episode released in June. Yep. Um, so we've been pretty strategic about it, trying to make sure we do it right. Um, and so we actually have a sponsor for the tour. It's uh, sheath underwear and, uh, they make really great guys underwear. And so, um, they're really passionate about spiritual health as well as physical health. And mm -hmm. so we're really excited to be working with them and, um, uh, they're a big part of helping to make things happen, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then we'll also be for the tour, we're going to be working with mental health America, uh, raising some money for them. And, um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of good, uh, it's, you just asked me when it started. How did I get into all that? Uh, anyway, so beer was uh, actually founded in. <laughs> for sure. No, it's good. Off on a tangent there. Yes, absolutely. Um, no, that's powerful, man. It's really, it's really important. And this thing, this always comes back to the idea that no matter who you are, you know, where you come from, all that sort of stuff, you need goals in life. You know, you need a direction forward. And I yeah. think, the biggest thing that people, and I'd love for you to um, touch in on this as well, but the biggest thing that I find as a counselor is that people are aware of why they fall into a rut. They're aware of why they get stuck, but they can't seem to get out of that state of rumination. And, you know, the yep. best thing in that place to do is to start thinking about a new life, a, a goal for tw by the end of 2020, something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um... And I think that's, that's such a big part of it is that like people have things that they want, but it's like a lot of times don't set practical, yeah. you know, small goals here and there to, to get to that place. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it I think has to do, and a lot of what's held me back over the years from doing, following my passions is fear. Yeah. You know, and um, most of the time, we don't recognize it, but even when we do, it's hard to step outside of that fear of, you know, financial security of not having financial security or not having support from the people we love or whatever it is. And, you know, it's hard to step outside of that and make progress. And I mean, we see that I, I've seen that anyway, and people staying in bad relationships, you know, like they, I, I did that for years where I was just afraid that there wasn't something better out there for me. So why would I leave this thing that I have that's constant and consistent and secure? Yeah. You know, but that was also based on this whole, like, I have to be in a relationship concept, you yeah. know, yeah. instead of just being happy with myself. Yeah. And so I think it's like a combination of that individual security, being okay with who you are. Um, and stepping outside of your fear to be, who you feel like you need to be. Absolutely, man. And you know what? 
it's especially pertinent in relationships, devouring relationships, because the idea there is you're in this relationship and it's just founded on years and years of just intimacy. And, you know, like there's, there's a strong attachment there, you know, it's, it's undeniable. And part of the reason why people stay in relationships like that is because they, there's no other alternative. They don't have an, a desirable end goal. You know, there's no like, imagine what life could be like if dot, 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 you know, if we weren't fighting all the time, if this and that, if I had a better job, if I you know had things to look forward to and we get stuck in those positions because we don't see any other alternative. And again, it comes back to that thing you were talking about before with goals for 2020. You can do that in relationships too. It's like, right, you and I are going to sit down practically, as you said before, Zach, we're going to sit down and we're going to make sure that by the end of the year, we're having sex more, you know, the kids are better. We're, at whatever it needs to be, but it has you've to got be. that new job you've been wanting. Yes. Yes, exactly. I'm excited to get yeah. up. Yep, absolutely. You know, um, it's, it, uh, I've been kind of stuck on something. So I've, I've got a buddy here in Seattle. Um, some of you guys may have heard of Jay uh, from Masculinity Mastered, um, but he's got this really cool thing um, that he's been talking about, like, what can you do in this moment? And I, I don't want to go too far on that because it's kind of his thing. Um, but uh, he, just this really cool concept, like what are the little things that we can do to, um, to, pro to progress? Yeah. You know, whether, whether it's even as simple as like making our bed to, you know, um, doing something bigger, like, I don't know, volunteering, <laughs> volunteering at a shelter. What's that? Changing the world. I'll make yeah, my bed or I'll just cure the whole world of cancer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, Jay, Jay's kind of concept is that like I'm sitting here watching TV doing, not being productive at all. Like what can I do in this moment right now that will be productive that will put, set me in a like forward moving path. Yep. You know? And so I've been kind of, I've been kind of thinking about that a lot and trying to make that a part of my daily cadence. Um, and make sure that I'm in each moment doing what I can. Mm, that's brilliant. And do you, when it's, cause this is something that people um, kind of get stuck on as well. It's like, I get that I have to do something right now, but then if I end up doing too much of that, I kind of get burnt out or I feel like I need to relax. So like, how do you mediate between doing what you can in the moment and then recognizing the time for rest and digest? I think it's just listening to your body, man. I think that's important. Um, I mean, I don't know. I've, I've had a lot of friends who have spouses or they themselves are, um, work overwork themselves, you know, like I worked for a really big corporation for a while, um, in operations and there were a lot of expectations and or implied expectations that people should work more than the hours that they're being paid for. Right. Um, which is something that I personally never subscribe to because, um, you know, I signed the contract for a certain number of hours. That's what I'm going to work, <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, and, but a lot of guys really overwork themselves and they get burnt out and they get tired and, um, they feel like all the work they're putting in isn't actually creating any value or the value that they hope to be creating. They're not progressing and getting promoted the way they want to. Um, at, all at the same time, their relationships are suffering, you know, their health is suffering, all of that. And it's just like, where's the, where do you draw the line? You know, where do you draw the line and recognize that you are harming yourself for something that you think you're supposed to be doing? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as well, human beings tend to do things when they want to. So that idea that money is the sole unit measurement of wealth where it's like oh, i should be doing all this it's like it completely takes away the idea that like well is this a job you enjoy because if you don't enjoy it you will never climb the hierarchy and make the money you actually want to make that's going to allow you to live the life you want to live if you don't enjoy yeah. it you will hate every second of it absolutely Absolutely. Um, I had some very miserable days, uh, weeks, months at my previous job right. um, for that reason alone, because I hated what I was doing and I could not find any joy in it whatsoever. Yeah. Um, 
and that gets pretty rough for sure. Massively. And it's hard as well. You know, like people, people have, you know, reasons other than the fact that, you know, they hate it, that they're, they're there, you know, like they have huge debt and um, lack of knowledge, education. Um, so it, it is tough. But again, I love what Jay said and I love what you're talking about in terms of practicality. It does it come down to like, okay, I get that goal of living my dream life, you know, quote unquote, could be however many years away. But what can I do like right now just to move the needle as best I can ever so slightly, you know? Yep, absolutely. It's powerful. It's really powerful. I love it. You can always get very, uh, very fulfilled having a mental health conversation. It's exciting. <laughs> yeah, I, I live on them, man. It's all, I'm all about it. You know, like seriously, I think some of the most joyful times in my life are, you know, having conversations with strangers about, um, just about what's important, what they're passionate about and, or what's hurting them, you know, what's bothering them and how they, how they plan to, you know, um, just to change that and make, make their lives better. You know, I, I love those conversations. And I think without those, a lot of people can't process what they need to process to really find the success they're looking for. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, excuse me. If you could um, give us like a, a clear takeaway or like the one lesson that really helped you move from where you were to, to where you are now living this kind of life, uh, what would it be? Uh, so yeah, one of the big things I took from my days in the church, um, is actually, uh, it's from, it's a Bible verse. It's first John three eighteen, And it says, dear children, let us not love through words and tongue, but through actions and in truth. Mm. Wow. And it's short and simple. Um, but I try really hard to to live by that now. Um, I took, I, I spent so long without taking action. It was all talk and it was all like ideas and things that I wanted to do. And I was never acting on those things. And so uh, when I started traveling, that was one of my big things. Like I started telling everybody that I was going to Scotland, Hey, I'm going to Scotland. I'm, I'm doing this in August. I'm going to, you know, and it, it kind of created this form of accountability to where my words became action. Mm. And so, you know, and, and the word love is really key in that. And there's a, a really popular verse that's used for uh, marriage ceremonies pretty often, which is that love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not, you know, whatever. First uh, Corinthians 13. And um, that to me is much less a marriage vow and much more a definition of love and how God loves us as humans and therefore how we, how we should love others as well. Mm -hmm. And so those two tied together, it's basically like, how am I loving others in that way through my actions? And so that's probably my biggest takeaway. That's brilliant. Because they, they say everything, don't they? You know, you can say whatever you want, but what you do reflects the, uh, the thoughts in the head, which ones you value most. That's brilliant, man. I love it. Uh, Zach, where can, where can people find you? uh man all over the place so uh keep an eye on into the dark blue on the the instagram um we'll be uh we've we've got the cities released on there for the tour um but like you said earlier into the underscore dark blue on instagram we are at in the dark blue.com and there you can find our podcast you can find uh the blog the real real guys real talk blog and uh, hoping to see your uh, submission there soon. Definitely yeah. want to hear that story. <laughs> yes, yes, writing it. <laughs> yeah, yes, so yeah, you guys look out for uh, Tom's story on Real Guys Real Talk. And, um, and then uh, I also actually have a book of poetry on Amazon if you're interested. Oh, cool. uh, it's called Nomad Psalms. Nice. So you can, can get that on Amazon. It's uh, I call it poetry for the wanderer. It's uh, kind of a lot of free verse poetry. Um, basically a lot of the, just based on a lot of the things I was experiencing in that transition from, uh, from church and relationship to freedom of self. Yes. Brilliant. Brilliant. I think that's what we'll call the podcast, man. From church and relationship to freedom of self. Nice. I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm in for it. 
Yes, brilliant. Mate, we did it. We got the podcast sorted. First of many. Yes. <laughs> What's uh, that? First of many. First of, first many. of many. Yes, I would left, definitely love to do this again. So, For sure, bro. We'll definitely will. All right, mate. Thanks, guys. Peace. Yep. Cheers. Oh, yes, mate. Thank you for the beer. <laughs> mate, we got that. <laughs> How good is that? Loved it. <laughs> yeah, that was great. I love that, man. It, they're always so good and yeah i love it it's just a great technology you know like you just we don't have to travel obviously real person's the best thing but it's a great way to meet people online yeah totally man i i've actually really created some great relationships just through instagram mm. you know um like jay i actually met we like we started talking on instagram and it turned out we both live in seattle and it was just like well let's meet up yeah <laughs> you know um and then like uh adam asher from the edge of adventure um we've been we've been chatting a bit and then um yeah just several guys that just really are oh and uh the man under construction um yep. that dude also um you know a lot of guys are just really on point and they know their mission and they know what they're trying to do with their their lives in terms of helping others and they're really focused and um just making a difference man and um i it was kind of the same thing with you. Like I noticed that you just have that very uh, driven um, and active um, purpose. Like you're just, you're doing what you're set out to do uh, and actually making a difference. And um, you know, I listened to a few of your, your podcast episodes and I was just like, man, this guy, this guy knows his stuff. So um, <laughs> I'm glad to be talking to you. Yes. Yes. No, it's good. It's uh, my, my biggest thing is, you know, I wrote my first book um, and that was all about, you know, mental health and anxiety and depression and stuff. And this book I'm writing now is more pertinent because it's all about um, my existential crisis. So it was like, it was very strange. Like this book here, this is the first one. And that was all about, when my mind started going crazy on me and it was all very yeah. much OCD, panic attacks and depression, all that sort of stuff. Then I came out of that and my um, missus and I started traveling and um, we, I, I, you know, I realized that because I loved her to bits and, you know, I, I um, love traveling as well, that my call, you know, to, to be a, an athlete, to be an AFL, a footballer and then like a CrossFit regionals athlete and all that sort of stuff, um, was going away for me because I, I was doing this other thing that um, yeah. wanted me more. So then I went through this huge journey of changing my identity and I, I didn't want to initially. So it was a, wow. hell of a, lot that was of a big change. Yeah. Yeah. And then just moving through that process essentially. So the whole mind mate thing is essentially around how to structure your life so that whenever you're moving through an existential crisis, you can always go back to the framework that you've produced so that you never lost along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I, it's, you know, that's the thing I feel like, I feel like we all have like our core self. Yeah. You know, and then we have the experiences that build up around it, mm. you know, and they create this, um, this almost new being as it goes along. And I really love the, like the Buddhist concept that we're never, we're never the same person at any moment. Yeah. Right. I love that because we're always, always learning, taking things, taking new things in, having new experiences that shape us and make us something different in even minute ways, you know? And, and sometimes, yeah, it comes down to like, we need to get back to that core. Like you're saying, we need to get back to this, like, who, who is my foundation? Yeah. You know, what is my foundation? And am I, am I, building on that foundation and acting on that foundation or have I gone away from that and have I accepted more of the negative influences in my life and therefore I'm breeding more negative influences or am I taking the negative influences in my life and turning them around and breeding positive influences? Yes, exactly. You know? And, um, you know, even more deeply, why is that my foundation? Like, <laughs> yeah. why, why is that narrative the story that I act out? Because when right. you get there, it's like, holy fuck, like I'm, I'm <laughs> nothing. And then yeah. it gets freaky. <laughs> <laughs> it does, you know, like when you sit down and try to strip away like all the religion and all the things that your parents have taught you and all yeah. of like 
the things that your friends have told you that you've believed for years and all your shitty ex-lovers have told you, you know, because they're assholes and they're trying to make you feel like an asshole, you know? Uh, <laughs> oh. um, it's like when you strip all of that away, you're like, who am I actually? Mm. You mm. know? Um, so that's like one of my favorite meditation practices is to like, like I'll sit down and I'll, I'll like vision, envision a force. Yeah. And like one by one, I'll take things out of the forest. Like I'll take out the animals and I'll take out the tree or take out the grass and then I'll take out the sky and the trees. And it's like, it, at a point it becomes just a blank canvas. Wow. And it's like when you're breathing and existing and staring at that blank canvas, it's like, what, what are you in that moment when there's nothing? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And you know what? I think just to, um, I don't want to give the whole book away, but it just like, it's so relatable in this experience. It's like, I think when you go to that level of depth and you really start to consider yourself and obviously well, that's a continuing journey when you really start to think about who you are and why you've become that person and you get down to the idea of it's like, Oh, well, I'm actually nothing. What I have found in my own experience is essentially who do you want to be? You know, yeah. you start to realize the amount of layers that have been thrown and dumped onto you through external experience and all yeah. of that stuff, you get to the very bottom and you're like, okay, I'm actually going to build my own layers, build my own meaning and become who I'd like to be as opposed to right. all these other influences dictate my life. Absolutely. And, and it all comes down to making the decision to do that. Yeah. Like all, all of my friends who are, have been in abusive relationships, not just friends, but people that I've worked with and talked to, like um, been in abusive relationships or have addictions or have things in their lives that they just like are perpetual, but they're decisions. Yeah. They're because of decisions. Um, it never changes until that person is ready to change. Like, it doesn't matter how much fucking advice you give somebody to like, Oh, you should change this because you should do that. It might help. You should, you know, whatever, like no one's going to hear your advice until they're ready to, yep. you know, and it come that, that also comes down to being that self that you want to be. Yes, exactly. Yes. Because again, who's to say that the advice that you're giving the shit that worked for you will work for them. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. <laughs> it's like, this is just from my personal experience. But. Yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, bro, I, th I reckon we'll just leave all that shit in the podcast as well. That was awesome. <laughs> hey, that's totally fine with me. Done. All right, man. Uh, I will speak to you soon. And everybody listening, we both love you all. Yes, absolutely. Catch you later, brother. <laughs>